Well, let's go to uh, Judges chapter three. And once again, I want to teach the, uh, the chapter, um, starting with Ehud, which is, starts in verse 12. And I'll just teach it straight through, and let's talk about that. And that's the way we read the Bible. We read the Bible verse after verse after verse. So it's really good if we can understand it that way. And it's, um, I got to thinking again about how important it is to take time out of our lives to read the Bible and, and just read the records, get out the Bible atlas, try to understand what's going on. And, and then it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears or something that the first time you read it, it might be brand new, but the fourth or fifth time you read it, it's like you're, you're getting a picture of what's the movements and what's going on. And so then it's about kind of mining it a little bit and saying, okay, God, why did you write this? What are you trying to teach me? Why is this here? And some of that's pretty easy to see and it's on the surface. And some of that's buried in the languages and, and takes a little more knowledge to dig it out. But uh, the, the record of Ehud was buried in the judges. Let me talk just a little bit overview about the judges. The judges uh, in Israel, where you have Othniel, Ehud, then Deborah, uh, then Gideon, then Samson. And you, you go through the judges of Israel. It's about a 400-year period, 400 years, a little less, actually where the, the, the Israelites completely reveal their stubbornness, <laughs> you know, and, and, their, and how, how easily your average human being drifts away from God. And that's why God calls people like the judges, God calls people like us into the, into the, into the body of Christ, into the world around us, not so we can be upset with people, but so that we can have compassion for people and realize that when we're looking at the population around us and they're ignoring God or they're doing their own thing or they're forgetting God or they won't take time to read their Bible or whatever, this is absolutely nothing new. This is what God's people have put up with literally since the fall of Adam and Eve. And so again, it's it's not about getting upset with people, you know, why aren't you guys doing more, that kind of thing. It's about, it's about compassionately loving people, setting the example, continually coaxing people along. And so that's what we see in the judges, that God raises up judges. And we'll get into that a little more when we get specifically into Ehud. By the way, I love the book of Judges. Um, it is I love Ecclesiastes too. I think Judges or Ecclesiastes are my top two loves for books in the Bible. And one of the reasons I love Judges so much is I call it the no excuse book. And if you've heard me teach on Judges, then you know that. Because if you look at all the Judges, one by one, they kind of knock down all the reasons that I might have, perhaps you might have, for being upset with God or upset with people or whatever, because it starts out with Othniel. He's the first judge, and he comes out of, uh, out of a, a prominent family in Israel. He had the name, he had the money, he had the land, he had everything, and he put everything at risk to deliver the children of Israel from, from their oppressors and from bondage. And then the next guy you run into, we're going to study tonight, is Ehud. And Ehud was a left-handed man. And he's a left-handed man in a right-handed culture. And not just a, not just a right-handed culture, but a right, you've got to imagine, it's a right-handed culture that had no soap and no toilet paper. And so in the culture, you, you, you know, you wiped yourself with your left hand. And so if you were a left-handed person, there wasn't a lot you could do socially with your left hand. It, for the most part, it just kind of was there. Um, and so to, to be a left-handed person was a significant disadvantage. And, you know, he could have been mad at God about that. He could have said, you know, God, you made me with this, and I hate it, and I hate you, and I'm not doing anything. But, but he didn't do that. 
And, and he, got, he got right in the fight. And we'll see that as we go into Judges 3. Judges 4, we pick up Deborah. And Deborah was a woman in a man's culture. And not like a man's culture where people think maybe today is a man's culture, but a woman in a culture where women were really genuinely oppressed, uh, denied opportunities, looked down on. And yet she, she rose through the ranks and, and led the people of Israel to victory in the defeat of the Canaanites. And then the next guy we re meet is uh, Gideon. And Gideon was, he came from a family of idolaters. Uh, he came from a poor family in Israel. And he, and he dealt with fear in his life. You know, Gideon's the one we talk about, Gideon's fleece. Why did Gideon have to put out a fleece? Because he was afraid. He didn't believe, was that really you, God? Was that really you? I'm not sure if that's really you. I'm, you know, and yet God worked with him. And, and lots of people are afraid or they're depressed. And God worked with him just like he'll work with any of us to rise to the top. And then, you know, after after Gideon was, was Samson, and I'll, you know, I, I can stop this, but Samson, well, I'm sorry, after Gideon was Jephthah. And Jephthah, um, if you've ever felt like your family didn't like you, you're alienated from your family, that was Jephthah. Uh, Jephthah's family, they were, they were very prominent in Israel. Um, they, they had a lot of land and a lot of power. But Jephthah was the son of when his father went out and slept with a prostitute, and he was an embarrassment to the family, and they kicked him out, basically. And so, uh, and yet he overcame that stigma, and he rose up to deliver Israel from the Ammonite invasion. And so here he's, he, you're, he's overcoming, and then the next guy you run into is Samson. And it's interesting that, you know, here's Here's uh, Ehud, the left-handed man. He gets an army together. Here's Gideon, the poor man who's afraid. He gets together an army. Here's Deborah, the woman. She gets together an army. Here's Jephthah, the son of a prostitute. He gets together an army. Here's Samson, the most able-bodied man in Israel. He's alone. And that eventually, by the way, that eventually got to him and led to his downfall with Delilah. But but he was he was alone, but he... He rose in, in what God wanted him to do, and he started the deliverance for Israel that allowed the space for the Israelites to, uh, to, to nominate a king or bring a king forward. God actually told them who should be the king, and they, they inaugurated a king and then had got King Saul. But the reason they were able to do that was because Samson had so devastated the enemy that they had a hiatus of space where they could put a king in place. And that first king was Saul. So when I look at when I look at judges, I think of myself. And if I'm not rising to the top of my game, then I ask me, why? I mean, that's why I love judges. It's a perfect mirror. It's like, okay, Shane, what is it? What's your excuse? You know, are you too lonely? Does your family not like you? Is you know, it's like, no, you know, any one of us can get in the game if we really want to. And Ehud certainly did. And so he's chapter three. So let's go to chapter three, verse 12. And immediately we start out with the recalcitrant sheep. <laughs> you know, the children of Israel again did what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. It's like, la, 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 they ought to make a song about it. And in every two verses, you could sing the children of Israel did what was evil again. And that's that's people. You know, we do our best to, to get people to follow God and they go wandering off in some crazy direction. So they're doing what's evil in the sight of Yahweh. And it says, Yahweh strengthened Eglah and the king of Moab against Israel because they had done what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. A lot going on here. The first thing we need to, to be aware of is when the Bible says Yahweh strengthened Eglon. That is a Hebrew idiom. It is not, we, we, we should not take that literally in the sense that, you know, here's God and now he's mad at his children, Israel. And so he's going to strengthen the enemy. That's not what's going on. This is the idiom of permission. If you want to read a lot more about it, you can go to the REV commentary at Exodus 
4.21. Exodus 4.21 has the major entry. But the, but the idiom of permission is, if God has moved in some way that has caused a, a, a bad reaction, then they blame God. The perfect example in Exodus 4.21 is the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, just on the surface, you already know that's that makes no sense. God wanted Pharaoh to have a soft heart and let Israel go. And he sent Moses to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. If the will of God was that Pharaoh let the people go, why would God harden Pharaoh's heart so that he wouldn't let Pharaoh, the Israel go? And the answer is God didn't. Then why does the Bible say he did? Because it's an idiom. And here's the way it works. God says to Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, Pharaoh's heart wasn't, he, he didn't like the Israelites and he had enslaved the Israelites, but he didn't have a hardened heart against the Israelites in the sense that he had to have later on. But when, as soon as God said, let my people go, now Pharaoh's got a choice. He can obey God and let Israel go and everything's going to be fine. Or he can say, you know what, God, heck with you. I'm not going to let these people go. They're my slaves. I'm hanging on to them. And in order to do that, he had to harden his heart. So it wasn't that God hardened his heart. God asked him to let Israel go. Then he hardened his heart in response. And because he hardened his heart in response to what God says in the Hebrew idiom, they say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, here, God told Israel, you know, obey me, worship me, put away all your idols. Israel didn't do it. They said, no, God, we're not going to obey you. We're not going to put away our idols. We're not going to stop, you know, our ritual sexual practices and all that kind of thing. And when they hardened their heart against God like that, then that allowed the devil to work to bring in adversaries that would afflict them. And that's what's going on here. The children of Israel rejected Yahweh, and therefore the devil was able to strengthen Israel's enemies against Israel. And that all comes out in this idiomatic phrase, Yahweh strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they'd done what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. A, a lot going on here. Uh, still, uh, one thing is that as we read the record, we're going to find out that Eglon is, is being set up to be a sacrifice for God. When, when he attacks God's people and enslaves them, which he did, for 18 years, which is a long time, then he's setting himself up as an enemy of God, and he's setting himself up to be sacrificed. And the, the Bible is going to draw this out a little bit at a time. The first thing is his name is Eglon. Now, Eglon is the diminutive of the word for bull. You could, you could translate it maybe little bull, but a better idea would perhaps be bull calf. So whenever you have a sacrifice, as you guys know, you sacrifice a bull on the altar or a calf on the altar or a lamb on the altar or whatever. So right away, you have Eglon, and his name means bull calf or little bull, if you will. And then as we go through the record here, you'll see a few other things that point to him being a sacrifice. By the way, given this record, I think it's possible that his real name was not Eglon, but that that was a name God gave him for this record so that we would know what's going on in the record. Now, God does that a number of times in the Bible. For example, the book Job, Job was not his name. We don't really know what his name was, but the word Job means the attacked one. Well, Job was very definitely attacked. If you're a native Hebrew reader and you read, this is the book of Job, it's, this is the book of the attacked one. And you go, oh, well, I guess whoever the main character is, he's going to be attacked. <laughs> and sure enough, he was. 
Another example of that is Delilah. You know, Delilah means wasting away or pining away. And so when, when here's Samson and he's lonely and it says he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah, and whose, whose name is pining away, whose name is wasting away. And, and as soon as you read that in the Hebrew text and you go, oh, right, you know, like her mother named her wasting away. That's not going to happen. You know, so she's got this name that's actually a designation. And as soon as you read Judges 6, you know, that there was, a, or I guess, Judges 16, that there was a woman in the Valley of Sorek whose name was wasting away. Then you go, oh, I know what's going to happen to Samson. So I think that's the same thing that's going on here in, Ju in Judges 3.12, that you've got this guy named Eglon, little bull. And you're like, okay, I think we've got a sacrifice coming. Verse 13, so he gathers to himself the children of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and struck Israel, and they possessed the city of palm trees. You've got a number of things going on here. First of all, when it says he struck Israel, it's a word for smote or even strike down, meaning that there's, there's a war. It's not like the Moabites come marching in with a brass band and the Israelites say, yeah, we'd like to be your slaves. You know, they, they took the land by force. They had to kill a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of men were killed. A lot of families were displaced. A lot of women were raped. Um, you know, that went on when verse 13 says they possessed the city of date palms. Um, the city was called Jericho, but once the walls were knocked down, then they um, there was just a bunch of palm trees around. And so the name changed and it became called the city of palms or the city of date palms. So the city of date palms is the city of Jericho after the walls fall down. And you'll see that several times uh, through the Old Testament. Now here's the Moabites and the Moabites gather up the Ammonites and the Amalekites and attack Israel. Now, there's, there's some things going on here behind the scenes. One is, here comes Israel with this huge army out of Egypt. And they've got to go around the east side of the Dead Sea, which means they're going to go right through the territory of Moab and right through the territory of Ammon. And they could have easily cleaned house and taken those kingdoms. But look what happens. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 2. And in Deuteronomy chapter 2, we'll start in verse 8. Um, the uh, text is, is reading verse 8. So we passed beyond our brothers, the children of Esau. Those are the Edomites who live in Seir away from the Arabah road. The Arabah is the desert by the, the Dead Sea. It comes from Elath and from Ezi and Geber, which is in the south. Uh, we turned and passed through the road by the wilderness of Moab. So there's they're on the east side of the Dead Sea. They're going toward Moab. Verse 9, Yahweh said to me, do not harass Moab nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of his land for a possession, because I've given it to Ar, to the children of Lot, for a possession. The children of Lot were the Moabites and the Ammonites. And if we go down to verse 19, same chapter, Deuteronomy 2, chapter, verse 19, God says to Moses and the Israelites, and when you approach the territory of the children of Ammon, do not bother them nor fight with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the children of Ammon, because I have given it to the children of Lot. And that, again, the, the sons of Lot were Moab and Ammon. So when Israel was coming out of Egypt and had their, their army ready, you know, they, they, they had fought some battles. They were keen to war. They were about to march into Canaan. They could have cleaned up Moab and cleaned up Ammon. And instead, God said, don't touch Moab or Ammon. How, do Moab, how does Moab and Ammon repay Israel for that great kindness? As soon as Israel shows a little weakness, they march over into Israel, kill a bunch of people, take over a bunch of cities, rape a bunch of women, you know, and there's a there's a, a mini lesson there about people in Thanksgiving. I know I've in my life I've helped people that have turned around and stabbed me in the back. You probably in your life, if you've lived as many years as I have, or even not as many, 
have, have helped people out who later on either ignore you, defy you, stab you in the back, say bad things about you, whatever, you know, and, and it's here in God's word. And see, again, the word of God is written to teach us. We're supposed to draw lessons for this. One of the lessons for this is just because you do something for somebody, don't, don't, you know, don't hang the moon on the fact that they're going to, they're going to love you in return. Some people may, and praise God for that. But don't be surprised if somebody that you helped and blessed turns around and stabs you in the back. You're looking at an example of that right here. That kind of thing happens. Um, and so what happened as a result of that, verse 14, the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. There's an interesting mini lesson in this, too, because the children of Israel could have served God willingly, and God would have blessed them. Instead, they defied God. And so now they're, sa they're serving Satan and his minions unwillingly, unwillingly, and it's miserable. You know, and I forget the name of the artist and many of you guys who do music much better than I do will remember the guy who sang that song, You've Got to Serve Somebody. Um, and it's really true. You, you, you're going to serve somebody. And the children of Israel decided they didn't want to serve God, but then they end up serving the devil and his children. Verse 15, and the children of Israel cried out to Yahweh. So Yahweh raised up a savior for them, Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjamite, a left-handed man. And the children of Israel sent by his hand a tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. And there's so much in this verse. Well, we'll take it apart uh, piece by piece. First of all, there's some really interesting humor here because it says Ehud, the son of Gerah, was a Benjamite, a left-handed man. The word Benjamin, the name Benjamin, is Ben Yamim, son of my right hand. So he's of the tribe of the sons of the right hand, but he's left-handed. <laughs> and the fact that it, you know, it, it didn't have to say he was a Benjamite. It could have just said they raised up uh, Ehud, the son of Gerah, who was left-handed. But they they, it, it, they put this word, the, the Benjamite, in there just to, to like poke, poke, and, and get us kind of smiling and laughing. Uh, so that's one thing. The word Ehud itself uh, likely means, of course, this is somewhat debated, but it likely means where is the splendor? Or where is the glory? That's what the name Ehud most likely means, according to the best scholars that I could read. Now, the interesting thing then is if if you're a dad and you're or a mom, and you name your child, where is the splendor? Where you know, or where is the glory? Then that would show you that this that Ehud was probably born in the early years of the Moabite oppression. When the uh, many, like I say, the uh, many Israelite men had been killed, women had been raped, families had been broken up. It was just a really, really, really difficult time to be alive. And you could see where a child would be born and he would be named, Where is the Splendor? And so this tells us then if the if the Moabite oppression was 18 years, and if I'm right about Ehud and when he was born then he's probably a 16-year-old kid, 17-year-old kid when, when he's called upon by God. This fits perfectly with what we see. The apostles were probably right about that age when Christ called them. Jeremiah, if you remember when he was called, you know, God said, I'm sending you. Jeremiah, I don't know, I don't know how to speak. I'm, I'm a youth. God said, don't say you're a youth. And, and uh, so Jeremiah was, and he wasn't married. So Jeremiah was probably 14, 15, maybe 16. Um, and I think that's probably the guy we're dealing with with Ehud. And that is one more mini lesson in here, which our youth can take a lot more responsibility sometimes than we give them credit for. We just need to give them, we need to give them some responsibility, give them some room, coach them, mentor them, and let them make a few mistakes, but they've got to rise up and take over. They will sooner or later anyway. And then, and then another thing I want to point out is when it says Yahweh raised up a savior for them, uh, they didn't really deserve it. It says they cried out to Yahweh. Why? Because they were in pain, because they wanted food, because they wanted their land back. 
So they cried out to Yahweh. It doesn't say they begged his forgiveness, that they offered sacrifices to him. You know, they're kind of doing the minimal thing. There's another mini lesson in there for us. Sometimes if somebody's been way out to lunch with God, you know, our, and, and they, they all of a sudden want to come back and they're like, I'm back. And we can kind of be like, well, you know, <laughs> just like that, you're just going to come back like that. And then we get all up on our high horse and stuff. But the fact is, that's really all you need to do. You know, God, God accepts people who do that. And, and we we have to accept people, too, and just realize that's people. And we've got to have the same heart that God does to bring people back in, pull them back in, get them realigned with God. And we certainly see that here. And then it says um, that Yahweh raised up a savior. Sometimes that just sounds so glorious. Yay, I'm a savior. <laughs> you know, and, and we think about the judges, but then you start you start looking at the judges. None of them had an easy life. And then you look at the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, you know, hold of the they didn't have an easy life at all. And here's you know, the Apostle Paul, and everybody knows the name of the Apostle Paul. It's like, yay, the great Apostle Paul, and he was the great Apostle Paul. But here's how the Apostle Paul described his life in 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 26 and 27, which you can go to if you want. 2 Corinthians 11, 26 and 27, he says, um, in frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the open country, in danger at sea, in danger among false brothers, in labors and struggles, in many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and without adequate clothing. Well, there's the great Apostle Paul. You know, and I think um, Hundreds of prophets and, and apostles and, and godly men and women can't be wrong. <laughs> that, that basically, if if the, the the devil is so sneaky and he's got so many systems in the world set up that it's very very difficult to stand up and really take a stand for God and not get beaten up for it. And so we've got to make up our mind. Are we going to stand up and get beaten up for it? Or are we going to try and fly under the radar and hope that nobody notices this? You know, that's not where we want to be. And that's not the way God's going to succeed. When, when God raised up a savior, Ehud, it wasn't like, like Ehud said, yay, I'm the savior. What a glorious position. You know, then he goes and risks his life. And it was just a miracle after miracle of God, as we're about to see, that, that he even survived. So anyway, the, the beauty of all this stuff. Oh, one last thing I wanted to point out in verse 15, because the children of Israel, uh, well, I, I like this too, because here's, here's Ehud, the left-handed man, who can't carry a tribute in his left hand, <clears throat> because that would, that would mean it would be you know, soiled or, or whatever. And it says, the children of Israel sent by his hand. <clears throat> so he's, he's holding, he's got to bring this tribute in his weak hand a tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, something that you need to be aware of is that this word tribute can mean gift or present, but it also is used for the grain offering that went with the bird offering. Because if you remember from the law of Moses, every bird offering had a grain offering that went with it. Um, and we can see this in a number of verses. We don't have to go there. But for example, Numbers 28, 18 to 20, talks about the, the animal sacrifice and then the grain offering. So now you've got Eglon, you've got, he's the little bull that's, that could be sacrificed. And now you've got the grain offering that would be sacrificed with him. And that's, that's again buried in the Hebrew because it's properly translated tribute. But anybody who reads the Hebrew fluently knows, well, isn't that the word for grain offering? Well, yeah, same word. So it's a tribute and it's a grain offering. Um, and so that is, in, uh, you know, reflected in this, this kind of setting Eglon the king up to be the, the, the fat calf sacrifice. So verse 16, 
Ehud made himself a sword that had two edges, a gomed in length, and he strapped it under his clothing on his right thigh. Uh, a lot in this verse. One is the word edges is actually in the Hebrew, the word mouths, uh, M-O-U-T-H, uh, your mouth. So this, the, the sword has two mouths. This is very common, by the way. Um, there's a lot of places in the Hebrew text. If you're reading the King James or another version and you read the word edge of a sword, it's often the mouth of the sword because the sword is personified and it's like you hold it out there and it, it eats your enemy. That's that's the idea behind the. So this this his sword had two mouths, one on each side, a gomad in length. This is the only place in the Bible that measure is used. People believe it's between 14 and 16 inches. We've never actually found one. There's just estimates. Um, but anyway, you're talking about basically uh, a long dagger, um, and, you know, 16, 18 inches in length. He strapped it under his clothing on his right thigh. Now, he did that way because he was left-handed, so he could reach it uh, very quickly because he's left-handed, so he can reach down, grab the sword on his right thigh. What you and I need to be aware of is inadvertently that may have saved him because all the soldiers use their right hand, shield with your left hand, sword with your right hand, and so if you were allowing someone to approach the king and you're the bodyguard, you're going to look, it's not going to occur to you to look on the right thigh because everybody puts their sword on their left side thigh so they can grab it with their right hand. So the fact that he had strapped under his clothing this sword on his right thigh meant that probably no one would, would look there. Uh, so if it was showing a little bit, you know, it was a little bump or something, that, that people wouldn't pay any attention to that. In 17, he offered the tribute to Eglon. Then it says, now Eglon was a very fat man. And this becomes very interesting because uh, he's the only man in the Bible that's specifically named and called fat. In Judges, Eli is called heavy, but he's not called fat. <clears throat> so um, Eglon is the only guy that's, that's specifically named in the Bible who is fat, and Ehud is the only man who is specifically named in the Bible who's left-handed. So you have the disadvantaged left-handed man, Ehud, against the fat man, Eglon. This is kind of an interesting battle. And when it talks about Eglon being fat, remember, he's the, he's the little bull, and now he's very fat. And this kind of, uh, there, there's a couple of things behind the scenes here. One is, if you remember the parable of the prodigal son, um, the father killed the fatted calf, and the fatted calf was a big deal in the biblical time period. And so here, now you've got the, the little bull who's very fat, and he's being offered with a grain offering. <laughs> you've got kind of behind the scenes, you've got this kind of perfect setup where, where God is setting up uh, Eglon to be an offering. And then... Um, the other thing that's interesting about this, when it talks about uh, him, if you remember, the, the most quoted passage in the Bible is Isaiah 6.10, which is, you know, which is the prophecy about, you know, make their hearts fat so that they hearing they don't hear and seeing they don't perceive. And so if your body is fat, then your heart is fat. And your heart is being your mind, your organ of thinking. And if we take a look at Eglon and the Moabites, that seems to show up in this record. There are things that they should have noticed that they didn't pay any attention to. They, there's, there's things they should have done, like when, when Eglon dismisses his bodyguard, he should have never been over overconfident and done that in the presence of an enemy soldier. I don't care if he's left-handed. You know, and the bodyguard just left. You know, and, and they shouldn't have done that. I mean, they could go and stand outside the door maybe, but they, there's there's just things that happen that indicate the people were dull in their brain. And that's exactly what Isaiah talks about when it says, make their hearts fat, because your heart in the biblical parlance is the organ of thought. Uh, your, your organ of emotions was your intestines and your guts. Uh, that's why we talk about bowels of mercies. 
So here's Eglon, he's, uh, verse 17, he's very fat. He's set up for the uh, sacrifice. And so verse 17 says, he, that's Eglon, or Ehud rather, offered the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, verse 18. And when he had finished offering the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. It seems to be buried in there, but it's a beautiful mini lesson about true leadership and compassion because Ehud had no guarantee from God that he wouldn't be killed. I mean, certainly there are a number of prophets who were killed in the biblical record. You know, and Ehud, Ehud is going to walk into the, the de facto capital city of an enemy king, walk into the palace and kill the king right there in the palace. And is he actually thinking he's just going to walk out? Like the king isn't surrounded by bodyguards. The king isn't going to scream out. People aren't going to hear. The whole place is going to be packed with soldiers. You know, he didn't, he had no promise from God that he was going to stay alive. And again, see, this is true commitment. When it says God raised up a, a savior, you know, Ehud, you know, yeah, yeah, he's the savior. He's a hero. But Going through it, he didn't have any promises. It took guts. It took courage. It took a willingness that, Lord, if it's going to be my death, it's going to be my death. It's like Patrick uh, Henry. I'm, you know, I regret I only have one life to give for my country. It's like Jesus Christ. You know, your will be done. You know, and we we see this with Eglon. And I love in verse 18 that when he finished offering the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. You know, and it would take many people. I mean, this is the tribute from all Israel. This is probably hundreds and hundreds of pounds worth of stuff. And it would just be this long train of people all bringing in things one after another. And so there'd be a lot of Israelites there. And, and Ehud knew what his job was, and he didn't want them around getting slaughtered. So he sent them away. That's true leadership, true, true compassion. You know, we talk about taking care of our people. This is taking care of your people. And that's how we've got to do. And he escorted them out. He made sure they got clear of danger. He, he gets them away from there in verse 19. But he himself turned back from the carved idols that were near Gilgal. Now, we know we don't know where exactly where Gilgal is, but we know it's probably only a couple miles from Jericho, but it's a couple miles from Jericho. And what's that tell you? It tells you that he got those, those burden bearers out of there and clear from danger. That's the compassion of Christ. That's the true heart of a leader. And then, so verse 19, he turned back from the carved idols that were near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. <laughs> the king said, hush. And all who were standing by him went out from him. Now, what's what's funny about this? Um, well, there's there's a lot of things in, in this. Once again, this these verses are so packed with cool information. When it says he turned back from the carved idols that were near Gilgal, what in the heck are they doing there? Gilgal was Joshua's camp when he crossed the Jordan River and he set up camp with the Israelites and got ready to march on Jericho. He set up his camp at Gilgal. That should be one of the holiest sites in all of Israel. Who in the heck is moving idols into that area? And why aren't the people standing up and tearing them down? See, nobody's taking a stand. They've just, they're throwing, gosh, God must have been so upset at this. And at Joshua, if, you, if there was such a thing as life after death, he'd be spinning in his grave. You know, who's putting idols near Gilgal, for Pete's sake? It's this creeping idolatry, and that's what the devil wants. You know, he, he takes an inch, takes an inch, takes an inch. And sometimes we Christians are too silent. We need to stand up and say, look, God says, you know, whatever God says, we, we take a stand. And then he says, I have a secret message for you, O king. But the word secret can be also secret or hidden. And the word message can be a word or thing or matter. So, it, you know, what he said, what the king heard was, I have a secret message for you. Likely what Eglon was thinking was, I have a hidden thing for you. Because <laughs> he's got a hidden dagger on his thigh. So there's, there's both things going on here in the same sentence. And, and the king says, hush. And all who were standing by him went out from him. And, and, it, and Ehud didn't have any promise that that was going to happen. 
you know, uh, the king's bodyguard just vaporizes and goes away. Uh, this, you know, sometimes when you, this is such a great mini lesson, because sometimes when we take a stand for God, if we'll just take a stand, God all of a sudden moves things that we couldn't in our wildest dreams think would be moved out of the way. You know, how is Eglon ever going to think that all of the king's bodyguards are going to be gone and leave him, an enemy soldier, in the presence of the king? How in the world is that going to happen? And yet he was bold, he obeyed God, he walked into the midst, willing to give up his life, and all of a sudden the bodyguard disappears. He's like, gee, many Christmas, I didn't expect this. You know, that's, that's amazing stuff. And, and we need to pray for that kind of thing. God, while I'm taking a stand, please bless me and, and make miracles happen like you did in the life of, of Ehud, you know, that kind of thing. We've got to pray for unexpected blessings, you know, while we're praying for stuff. Pray for unexpected blessings. So verse 20, so Ehud, Ehud came to him. He came to King Eglon, and he was sitting alone in his cool upper chamber, you know, just, just chilling out. And Ehud said, I have a message from God to you. And whatever that meant to Eglon, he arose from his throne, which is perfect because he's a very fat man. And as soon as he stood up, his, his whole belly and, and stuff were exposed right there in front of Ehud. In verse 21, and I, I, here we need to read this verse with such decisiveness because it was decisive, you know. And he had reached with his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. You've got determination. You've got deliberate action. It, it, as soon, you know, when, when Eglad stood up, he had just that, that split second there where there was the perfect target. He wasn't expecting an attack. He didn't probably realize that Eglon was even left-handed. So when Eglon started, I mean, when Ehud started to move his left hand, he probably didn't, didn't take a notice of it. But that, that had to be done with, you know, forethought, determination, deliberation, you know, seize the moment uh, because he couldn't just say, oh, that would have been a nice time to stab him. You know, and, and there are times like that in our lives too when we've just got to grab by the grab the bull by the horns and, and get it done. You know, and you see that with, with Ehud here. No wonder he's such a good leader. The determination and deliberate action, no hesitation. Um, and then all it, all it says is that he thrust it into his belly. Um, from what we know of physiology, he probably, I mean, he, he did thrust it into his belly, but he probably could not have thrust it straight into the belly because then it simply would have penetrated through the intestines and, you know, it would have hurt like crazy and it would have eventually killed Eglon, you know, whether in a couple hours or in a couple days. But, you know, he'd be yelling and screaming and carrying on. My gut feeling and from reading some of the commentaries that agree with my gut feeling is that that you know he's got a dagger there that's probably 14 to 16 inches long. He he thrusts it in like he's thrusting it into the belly, and as it penetrates the belly, he rotates and drives it up. Because if you if you want to make this a pretty quick, clean kill, you've got to get up into the heart area and cut either the arteries around the heart or stab the heart itself, something like that. Because otherwise, all you're going to do is you're just going to have uh, Eglon, you know, running around, yelling, screaming, bleeding, making a big mess. And then you're going to have a giant fight on your hands because all the guards are going to come back. So whatever he did, he he killed him very quickly. Ways we know that is because of verse 22, which says the handle also went in after the blade. Now for the handle to go in after the blade, it tells you that, that when this knife was made, it didn't have a hilt on it. You know, the thing that protects your hand from sliding forward and getting getting cut on the blade. Um, and that makes perfect sense because you don't want a hilt if you're putting it underneath your clothing because it would stick out. And furthermore, when he went to grab it, the hilt might get caught up in the clothing and you couldn't have a clean, clean draw. So that's why the handle can go right in after the blade. The, the, the guy's so fat, the fat closed over the blade for he didn't draw the sword out of his belly and the feces came out. And that's pretty common. We learn that when a person dies, uh, their, their, their muscles in their body relax, 
and their bowel muscles relax. And so it's, it's very common to have somebody and their bowels release. And of course, they, they would just have released right there on the floor where he was. And so uh, Ehud here makes another wise decision, which is he left the knife in the body. Uh, it would have taken some time to pull the knife out of the body for one thing. And if in doing that, he got blood on his clothing, then he never would have been able to make a clean a clean escape because everybody, you know, if he had fresh blood on his clothing, then everybody's going to, you know, where, where'd you get that? You know, it's not like, I, it's not like I cut my finger or something, you know, so it, uh, so what we see here kind of buried behind the scenes is this wise decision, walking with wisdom, leave the blade and the body, leave as quickly as you can, be deliberate about it, don't be hurried, don't make it look like you're in a panic, something like that. So verse 23, he went out on out to the porch, shut the doors of the upper room behind himself and locked them. And so he, he walked out and, it, you know, in pro proper oriental fashion, he would have backed out and then, he, he, you know, bowing and stuff like that. And then he just shut the doors like he was giving the king some privacy, locked them, went away. Deliberate, unhurried, didn't draw any attention. Verse 24, now after he'd gone out, the Eglon's servants came and they saw and behold, the doors of the upper room were locked. And they said, surely he's covering his feet in the cool upper room and covering his feet is an idiom for having a bowel movement because when you squat down, your feet are covered. Uh, we see the same phraseology used of King Saul when he went into the cave at En Gedi in 1 Samuel 24, verse 3, where it says Saul went into the cave to cover his feet. So we see the same kind of thing with King Saul. So the servants here, now the servants are in kind of an interesting situation. They don't want to walk in on the king while he's going to the bathroom. So they're going to wait outside. And, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting thing about the Oriental culture that they wouldn't want to walk in on the king. When we think about it, um, for all of the lack of good doors and glass windows and stuff like that in the Oriental culture, the, the biblical Eastern Oriental culture was quite respectful of privacy. Like the women had their side of the tent and, and men were not allowed in it. Um, and you, you can read the whole Bible. You never read any details about how exactly people went to the bathroom, how they cleaned themselves, you know, how women dealt with their periods. We don't have any idea of how women cleaned up after babies. Now we have diapers and it's really easy. <laughs> but, you know, what did, what did they do in biblical times? You know, and there's just... There's so many private things that simply aren't discussed in the Bible or other Eastern uh, literature. I mean, you read the, the literature we have from the Babylonian Empire, the Akkadian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, and that type of thing. It never describes any of those things. It, 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 in a sense, as barbaric as, as, as the society was in one sense, they were kind of prim and proper uh, and very respectful of of things in a, in a different way. So here's the king, and he's he, he seems to be going to the bathroom. And there's two reasons they would think that. One, the doors are locked. And two, it, there's all these feces and excrement on the floor. And Eglon was very fat. So you know that that really stunk and smelled up the place. And since it was a cool summer room and there was a breeze, they could all smell it. So they, that's why they said, um, they, they said, surely he's covering his feet in the cool upper room. And the reason they could say that is because they could smell it. In verse 25, and they waited anxiously until, anxiously until they were embarrassed. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, they, they just didn't know what to do. They didn't want to walk in on the king. But the other side of the coin is it's like, there's got to be something wrong here. So this is taking way too long. So they waited till they were embarrassed. And behold, he did not open the doors of the upper room. So they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down uh, to the ground dead. And what was happening in Ehud's life? Well, as soon as he got clear of the palace and the guards and the army men and whatever, he escaped while they waited. He passed beyond those carved idols 
and escape to Sirath. So he goes beyond uh, Gilgal and he goes up into the hill country of Ephraim. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, of Benjamin goes up into the hill country of Benjamin, well, and Ephraim. Um, and it came to pass, verse 27, when he had come that he blew a shofar in the hill country of Ephraim. And uh, that was a way of, of, of sounding a call to arms. That, you know, it's a war cry, if you will. And the children of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was before them. Again, he's a left-handed man, but he's he's a he's a good leader, and he knows, you know, these people are just coming out of idolatry. They've been oppressed for 18 years. They may not have a lot of confidence about whether or not they can they can kill off these Moabite oppressors. And so what's he do? A, a good leader knows when to step into the front and be deliberate and when to encourage others to step up and get, get their job done. And Ehud was a great leader. He read the temperature of the people, and he's going to go for the first, and he's going to set the example. Verse 28, and he, and he said to them, follow after me, for Yahweh has given your enemies the Moabites into your hand. And by mentioning Yahweh, he does two things. One, he humbly takes the, the attention off himself. You know, he doesn't tout himself as the great deliverer, the great savior of the people of Israel. He gives that credit to Yahweh. But also, these are the people that had forsaken Yahweh for years. So he's got to get them pointed back in the right direction. So he reminds them, Yahweh has given your enemy, not your gods, your stupid idols, but Yahweh has. And he points them back to Yahweh. And we, we got to do the same thing. When God does great things, we can point people back to Yahweh. They went down after him, captured the fords of Jordan leading to Moab, um, and did not allow any man to cross over. That's great wisdom, because um, in that time period, you know, there's not a lot of, of natural water. There's, with the exception of the Sea of Galilee, there's no lakes uh, in, in all. Well, there was Lake Hula, but it was very tiny and way far up north. Um, but in, in the main body of Israel between Dan and Beersheba, there weren't really any, any lakes to speak of except the Sea of Galilee and this little puddle of a lake above it. So people weren't natural swimmers, and the same thing with the Moabites. So the, the, the Jordan River, which if you're a good swimmer, is not particularly daunting. If you can't swim, it becomes very daunting. So if you want to get across it, you go to the ford areas. So if you're going to catch the Moabites, you go and capture the ford areas. When the Moabites show up, you kill them. And that's exactly what they did. And at that time, they struck down about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout ones and all men of valor, and no one escaped. And they didn't deserve to escape. They'd been murderers and rapists and, and, and horrific, you know, cruel people for 18 years. And they deserved the death penalty they got. And verse 30, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest 80 years. So the, the period of the time of Ehud, including the 18 years, and then the time of peace was a total of 80 years. And that's what that last verse is saying. So Ehud is a wonderful example to us. He was a savior raised up by God. He did risk his life. He, he was willing to walk into situations where it was from a fleshly point of view, pretty certain that he would die. Um, and God showed up big time and saved his life. And, and he was absolutely bold and did a great service for Israel and got the people free again. So uh, this has been really a fun record to read and study. And I hope you've been blessed by listening to it. And